Welcome back to ECE 501B. Today we're moving into the next chapter, which is chapter six, and we've been progressively enhancing our abilities to work with these concepts. Now we're going to return to these vector spaces that we started with in chapter one. In chapter two, we started talking about dimensions. We restricted to finite dimensional spaces. We could talk about span, basis, spanning sets. We started chopping up these vector spaces. Chapter three, we learned how to map between the spaces. So we had these spaces and now we learned how we could create these linear maps that might talk about range space, null space, etc. Chapter five said, oh, let's think about being able to move between a vector space back into the vector space and make these operators and not just linear maps. And now we have these square matrix representations of these operators. Now we're moving into chapter six and we're saying let's now put a few more restrictions or make the vector spaces have another property and that's what we'll talk about in chapter six and now we're going to be dealing with inner product spaces. We're going to put something more on to these vector spaces. We'll talk very quickly about the concept. We'll need to define an inner product. What that means, you've seen it, you've seen the dot product, you've grown up with it since first grade or whenever it was that you started doing dot products. The inner product is a generalization of that. A vector space with an inner product, if it, it, if it has an inner product on it, is called an inner product space. So it's just an enhanced vector space is an inner product space. We'll look at some examples of these inner products. We'll then be able to talk about different concepts, orthogonality. We have an intuitive feel for what that means in terms of vectors, but now we want to generalize that to abstract vector spaces. And what does it mean for one vector to be orthogonal to another? And it's going to depend on our definition of the inner product. Then we can return to something that we've, maybe in kindergarten, we did the Pythagorean theorem. But now you have reading material. I don't know if you are paying attention to what I'm posting on D2L, but there's now four more sort of articles in the course resource section. One of those is some extracted chapters from a book. And the first chapter of that book talks about the Pythagorean theorem and giving you some intuitive geometric feel for that. And then it goes on to talk about numbers going from rational numbers to reals on to complex numbers, etc. But there's some interesting articles and they deal with eigenvalues, the $25 billion eigenvector that the paper on Google is about. That's chapter five. Now we can start talking about chapter six. We'll deal with orthogonal decomposition. You've maybe done that with vector or with matrices and vectors. Now let's generalize that to more general abstract vector spaces and see what that means. And we'll be able to do this with polynomials, for example. Then we'll talk about some familiar or maybe familiar concepts, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So I may just call that CSI. Everybody may, well, maybe not everybody is familiar with CSI, but maybe you'll remember this is not crime scene investigation, but it's close, okay? It'll allow us to do some of this detective analysis and the triangle inequality. I guess that could just be TI, huh? What are these inner product spaces? Let me just get us thinking about what this is in very general terms. What this is going to allow us to do is it's going to provide our vector spaces that we've been playing with and we've allowed all of these vectors in quotes to be coming to us. They live or they belong to these vector spaces. Now what we want to do is provide these vector spaces with some more 
properties. And in particular, let's provide these vector spaces with the concepts of length. We really haven't talked about the length of these vectors. Now we'll be able to do that with this inner product notion and angle how far apart or how close are these vectors. And again, vectors are going to be the general vectors in these abstract vector spaces. Now, if you have length and angle, then we can start talking about distances. What's the distance between two vectors? And maybe even how close or the closeness of these vectors. If the angle between them is small, for example, we'll be able to define using the cauchy schwarz in CSI. To use CSI, we'll be able to figure out the angle between these vectors or the cosine of the angle. And now we can calculate the angle if we know the cosine. That's where we're headed. That's the concept. Now, to get us there, we need to create an inner product. And the inner product is just, it takes two vectors from a vector space and creates a scalar in our field of numbers. That's what it's doing. It's going to take these two vectors and combine them in some way and produce a scalar number. And you can sort of think of that as if you have a vector, what's the length of that vector? Not knowing all the coordinates, but now you know the length. That's taking you from a vector, in quotes, to a scalar, a number. So let's now look at this definition or rule that we can then apply to create many different inner products. inner product. The inner product between two vectors let's say V and W and they are elements of this vector space capital V we're going to create this new notation. It's going to be written as an angle bracket V comma W. And that's actually going to be just a number. We'll take two vectors and create a number. So here's our definition. An inner product is a rule that takes, and it depends on the order with which they appear in this bracketed notation. So it's going to take an ordered pair of vectors, let's say V and W. I guess I shouldn't change my That's just a pair of vectors. That, and then it takes that to a scalar. And the scalar is what we then put in these angle brackets. And that's going to then belong to whatever field of numbers we're playing with, F. So we take two vectors. They're ordered, V, W. And then we produce a scalar. But this inner product needs to satisfy some properties. Just like our vector space had to have properties, this inner product needs some properties. And let's now write those down. And has the following properties. 
one property we could call positivity. And that says that if we take the inner product with the vector itself, v comma v, then that needs to be non-negative. And you might read the comment in the margin of your book as to what that means when v is over the field of complex numbers. What does that mean here? And that means now that you have a real non-negative value greater than or equal to zero. Is what, that's what the greater than or equal to zero means. If v was over the field of complex numbers. We need this positivity. And that's when v is inner product with itself. So you could sort of think of this as, and we'll show this or see this, that's going to be in a vector sense, sort of the length squared of a vector v in our, let's say, two norm definition. We need positivity. We also need it to be definite. And so it's, let's say, definiteness which means that if we look at v with itself, then the only time that's going to be zero, so if and only if the vector itself is the zero element. The only time, so we need our inner product to produce zero only when the vector itself is the zero element. Otherwise, it needs to give us something non-zero or non-negative. Then it depends, I said, on it's an ordered pair. And so now what we want is we want it to possess additivity in the first slot. Meaning if we had two vectors that are added together in the first slot, then that's going to be equal to u w inner product plus, whoops, v w inner product for all, let's say, u, v, and w coming from our vector space V. So we have additivity in the first slot, meaning we can now just separate that addition in the first slot across or distribute it across. We also have homogeneity in the first slot. Again, we're writing down these properties that we, if we define an inner product, we need these properties to be satisfied. Homogeneity simply means if we have a scalar A scaling some vector V, and that's in our first slot in the inner product, then that scalar is going to come out immediately from our inner product of V and W. And that's for all scalars in F, whatever F is, R or C. And let's say V and W in our vector space. One final property is we want some symmetry, but it's actually going to be conjugate symmetry because we're allowing these vectors to be coming to us in, from the complex field of numbers. So we need conjugate symmetry to also hold, meaning if I now take V and W, that's the same as, or that's equal to, if I now reverse the order of the vectors, that it's now the conjugate of that. So this poorly written star is the complex conjugate. 
And I think in the textbook, Axler, he likes to use a bar over that. So just kind of keep track of the notation. Hopefully it'll be clear from the context. And that's true for all V and W that are in this vector space V. say a bar over something is what is used for the complex conjugate in the textbook. Now a lot of this simplifies if we're dealing over the field of real numbers. We don't have to worry about taking the complex conjugate and then we end up sort of with this dot product that we're familiar with. So we can say that this simplifies if our vector space V is not a complex vector space, but is a real vector space. And now we'll basically define what we mean for the title of our chapter. What is an inner product space? It's a vector space that possesses an inner product. So let me see if I can write that down. An inner product space, and now you can take this home to your roommate and start talking about the inner product space, and they're going to go, I don't know what you're talking about. But you now know vector spaces. Now we're just going to put on top of that notion an inner product. If you now create an inner product and it's OK in that vector space, now you actually have an inner product space. An inner product space is a vector space let's say V plus an inner product rule on V. Let's look at some examples of inner products in these vector spaces and their connection. Let's say that we now look at f to the n. That f could be r or c with an inner product. Then we have these vectors, let's say v1, v2, and obviously these vectors are coming from the same vector space, so they have to be the same dimension. If it's finite dimensional, then they have to have the same number of coordinates. Let's say that now v1, v2 are representing a coordinate in the vector v. These aren't different vectors. This is now coordinate 1, coordinate 2, up to coordinate n uh, in the vector v. And now we want to take the inner product of that with W, and now we're going to express W in terms of its coordinates, W1 through W sub n. This is now our vector V, and this is our W vector, the ordered pair in this inner product notation. What that now says then in Fn, in this n-dimensional vector space, this is just going to be V1 times the conjugate of W1 plus the second coordinate of the first vector times the complex conjugate of the second coordinate of the second vector. And that just continues and down to the nth coordinate of both vectors except you have to take the complex conjugate of the second vector's nth component. And if you think about this or look at this, this is just 
the Euclidean inner product that you're used to seeing. This is the Euclidean inner product that you're probably already familiar with from previous courses. And with this Euclidean inner product, or with the above rule, then we can actually say that when we take the inner product of V with itself, V comma V, that's going to equal the two norm of V squared. And that's then the distance squared of this vector V. So the squared Euclidean length of the vector V. And I think you can see then that if we restrict F to be just the reals, if our vector space V is now R to the N, then if we look at, let's say, U comma V as an inner product, that's going to be then this vector u, how do I want to write a vector? I bolded that, if you can tell. That's a bold. Maybe that's why I want to use a bar. That's not a conjugate. That's now the vector u dotted with the vector v, but those should have been barred too, right, if they're vectors. This is just the dot product that we're used to from previous classes. You just take the inner product, the dot product. That's what you've been using when your vector space is real. So this is the standard behavior. we would expect from geometric vector spaces. And that's our classical inner product with real numbers. We can also put together other inner products on other vector spaces. So other inner products are possible. For example, you could create another inner product on the same F sub n's that we just talked about. You could say, oh, here's an inner product, V and W. Let me now put a weight on each of these coordinate products, C1, and that's going to be a positive number. It could be 2, it could be 0.7, and that's now going to be times V1 W1 star plus C sub 2 V2 W2 star, etc., plus C sub n V sub n W sub n star with all of these C sub i's being positive reals. So now you could have a weighted inner product. As long as those C's are positive reals, then this satisfies all of those previous properties of an inner product, and we can have that if that's what we want. And maybe you want that weighting for certain optimization reasons or to measure certain distances, or maybe you want to make certain coordinates more important than other coordinates in your vector. That might be a reason for weighting these terms in your inner product. What if we looked at a more abstract vector space? What about 
P sub M of F are nth order polynomials. Or polynomials that are of nth order or less, essentially. Then we could create this. So now if we have two polynomials and they're ordered, P and Q, then one inner product might be if we integrate those two, let's say P of X and the complex conjugate of Q of X, DX from 0 to 1. That could be an inner product. So let's say that that's one. What's another one on that same idea? Well, what if I look at a specific case, maybe P2, quadratic polynomials, or P sub 2? Let's say P sub 2, and let's just say on the reals. Then you might have, for example, if V and W were quadratic, then you might say, you know what, let me take V at minus 1 and W at minus 1. Let me take V at 0 and W of 0 and add on V of 1 and W of 1. And that could be an inner product. Meaning, if you now looked at, let's say, V of T as T plus 1, and maybe W of T is T squared minus 1. These are now quadratic polynomials, or they're from the field, or this vector space of quadratics with real coefficients. Now we can build this idea up, we could say, well, V of minus 1, what's that equal to? I'm just sampling these polynomials at three different points, the first point being at minus 1. I replace T with minus 1, that gives me 0. V of 0, 1. I'm just sampling this polynomial. This is now a straight line, and I'm just sampling at three points. V of 1 is now 2. If I looked at W of minus 1, what does that become? 0. W of 0. I'm not paying attention. Minus 1, I took a nap. I think that made the front page of the Wildcat. I saw something nap room, so I'm hoping we get some in on campus. I don't know. Where, where did that come from? What's W of 1? 0. So now if we invoked this inner product that we just defined above, I have 0 times 0 plus 1 times minus 1, plus, using the notation, I guess I start, why did I, now, 2 times 0, and what's that end up being? Minus 1. So now my inner product of those two polynomials would be minus 1. Now, what you need to be clear on with respect to this definition of an inner product is that I had a second order, I had second order or less for my polynomials. They were t squared, that was the highest order of my polynomial. And how many samples did I pick in my inner product? One more than that, and that's critical. So I couldn't have had v of 0 and times W of 0, V of 1 times W of 1, that wouldn't have formed an inner product because then I could find non-zero Vs or W that give me a zero value for my inner product. That's what I'm trying to say here. Note, you need three zeros 
in P sub 2 of R to define an inner product. And if you carry that forward, if I now said, well, let's look at this space, vector space of fourth order polynomials, script P sub 4, how many terms in my inner product would I need in order to make this a valid inner product? I would need at least this many or more points in my sampled version of these polynomials. So in P sub 4, we would need to sample the vector or vectors at five or more values, values of t or x, whatever our polynomial is in, And once we've sampled it, and then take the inner product of those, let's say, five values. We could also, if we go back to the earlier u and or v and w, if we now looked at v of t equaling t plus 1 and w of t equaling whatever it was, t squared minus 1, is that what I used, I believe? We could also use another inner product, couldn't we? We could say, well, you know what, with those polynomials, why don't we do this integral from 0 to 1? of v of t times w of t, and I don't need to worry about the complex conjugate because I, because I don't have any complex numbers. These are in the field of real numbers, or this is a real polynomial vector space. So I now have v times w dt. Or this is now t cubed plus t squared, and then minus t minus 1 dt. Or that's 1 fourth t to the fourth plus 1 third t cubed minus 1 half t squared minus t, all evaluated at 0 and 1. And the lower limits, I'll evaluate to 0. I end up with 1 fourth plus 1 third minus one half minus one, which if I sort of play with the odd terms, I can add one fourth and minus one half to get minus one fourth. I can combine one third and minus one to get minus two thirds, common denominator being 12. I can say that one fourth is three twelfths, right? and two-thirds is eight-twelfths, or this now becomes minus 11 over 12, and that's another inner product. And what was my earlier inner product using a different inner product rule? Minus one. So my number that results, my scalar, may be different, but I should get consistent results if I stick with the same inner product for whatever I'm doing. Is that clear? You can build up many different inner products or create many different inner products in order to manipulate with inner product spaces. All right, so now let's look at what some of these properties allow us to do now that we have some examples that you're thinking about, hopefully. If we look at the first slot, 
we said that that exhibits additivity and homogeneity. Which means then if we fix a W in the second slot, we could now have a linear map, couldn't we? A linear map needs additivity and homogeneity. So this inner product could actually form a linear map. So for a fixed W, we could say that VW, this inner product, is a linear map. from whatever vector space we started with, V, into our scalars. We can also look at different properties in the second slot. So if we use the properties from the first slot, we can see that if we just fix a vector in the second slot, we now have a linear map from our vector space V into the set of scalars, F. We can also prove certain properties about the second slot. What can we say about the second slot? Well, suppose, well, it's going to actually be additive. If we now had a vector V, or let me go algebra or alphabetically here, Let's say this first slot is U, and the second slot is V plus W. Well, we don't know how to treat addition in the second slot yet, but we know how to treat it in the first slot. We know there's additivity in the first slot, but in order to move this term the second slot term into the first slot, we have to use our conjugate symmetry, don't we? So if we reverse these or flip the slots, we now have V plus W, U, but now I need to take the complex conjugate of that. By definition, right? We have conjugate symmetry in the inner product. But now let me just worry about the conjugate later, and now I have first slot additivity. I can now say, oh, this is now V U plus W U conjugated. Right? But now let me take that conjugate in to each term. The conjugate of a sum is the sum of the conjugates, meaning I can now do V U conjugate plus W U conjugate. But now let me apply my conjugate symmetry to each of those two terms, and which means I just conjugate each of those, which removes the conjugate, and I flip the slots. So that now in the first piece, I have U V plus U W. And now I've shown that I have additivity in the second slot. So now instead of deriving all of this every time, you can simply say, oh, if I have an addition in the second slot, I can just pull that apart and have additivity in the second slot based on just the rule for conjugate symmetry from before. What about homogeneity? Well, in this case, we actually have conjugate homogeneity. 
Meaning, if I now take u and I scale the second slot with a, I can now flip the slots but now I have to conjugate it, don't I? But now inside that conjugate, I could say, you know what, I know how to do the scalar in the first slot. That just slides out. So now I know that I have A, V, U, conjugate. And now the conjugate of a product is the product of the conjugates, so that I now know A star is V U conjugate or star. And I can simply flip the slots and remove the conjugate effectively. And now I have U V in my inner product and standing out front is the conjugate of the scaling that I did in the second slot. So I have conjugate homogeneity in the second slot. If I want to slide that scalar out from the second slot, it has to be the conjugate. And obviously if this is done with reals, you don't have to worry about these complex conjugates. It just slides out like you would maybe have anticipated. But if you have complex vector spaces, then you have to worry about that scalar and taking the conjugate of it. And now we can talk about some of these other issues that we've dealt with, in particular, norms. We've talked about various norms before. the one norm, the two norm, the three norm, the four norm, we really didn't talk too much about those, but we had the one norm, the two norm, and the infinity norm. We discussed those norms before, and not all of them really work too well with inner products, but the two norm does. So not all of these norms let's say, play nicely with inner products. And because of that, when we start talking about norms, we're just going to deal with the two norm. That's what we'll be using. So from here on out, we're going to define the norm as the norm of, let's say, a vector v is now the square root of this scalar that results when we take the inner product of v with itself. And if we define our inner product, if that inner product is the Euclidean, inner product, and it wouldn't have to be. We could be in this more abstract vector space and then the norm will have to be whatever the inner product is, and then we take the square root, and that will give us our norm. But if the inner product is the Euclidean inner product, then this definition of norm is our standard two norm. Then this is equivalent to our earlier 
definition. of the two norm. But keep in mind that whenever we talk about the norm, we're going to use whatever inner product we have picked or that we're using. However, we'll use this definition with any inner product. And if you look at the norm squared, where we've now scaled the vector inside the norm, that scalar we can just take its magnitude and square it and multiply it by the norm of V squared. That's equivalent, no matter what the inner product. Now that we have this inner product on these vector spaces, now we can start to do quite a bit. And the first thing we want to talk about is orthogonality. So let's now talk about orthogonality now that we have an inner product that sort of tells us how these vectors might align with each other. Orthogonality. Two vectors, let's say V and W, are orthogonal if when we look at their inner product it's zero. And I hope it's clear that this also implies that if we flip that, if we took the complex conjugate of zero, we're going to get zero back, or the inner product of W with V is also zero, if we know that V and W is zero. Some comments that we can make with respect to orthogonality is the following. One is the zero vector That's orthogonal to every vector. So if that's in some slot, you get zero out. And zero, the zero vector, is the only vector that is orthogonal to itself. So the zero vector is the only vector that is orthogonal to itself. Before we get into using this, let's just apply this orthogonality to something that's different than what you're used to doing. I'm assuming you've played with inner products and vectors. Let's now abstract this and look at polynomials and see what that might mean for polynomials to be orthogonal. And you're not going to see them in terms of maybe the standard thinking of being orthogonal necessarily, but we can make them orthogonal based on the inner product that we create. So now let's say that we are playing with these quadratic polynomials. And assume that our inner product that we're using is going to be one of the first ones that we talked about. We're just going to sample these 
polynomials at three points and multiply their coordinates. So we have v of minus 1, w of minus 1, plus v of 0, w of 0, plus v of 1, w of 1. And now on the test, I ask you the following. Find a vector w under this norm is orthogonal. Let me put that in here, which that is orthogonal with this inner product. IP, but I'm thinking you're all going to think intellectual property, so I'll just spell it out, IP. So now we have this inner product, and we want W to be orthogonal to V of T equaling T plus 1. So now we want to find a polynomial, one, there might be many, that are orthogonal to this straight line in this set or this space, vector space, of second-order polynomials. What do we do? How about we just create a generic vector and see if we can force some of the coefficients of that generic vector to create a vector w that ends up being orthogonal to v of t. How about we let w of t be some, let's say, alpha t squared plus beta t plus gamma. And we need to now find values for alpha, beta, and gamma such that with this inner product we end up with the inner product with w being 0. That's what we need. With this parameterized form of our vector w, w of minus 1, what's that going to be? Everybody get that? Alpha minus beta plus gamma. And what's V of minus 1? That's 0, isn't it? What about W of 0? That's just our constant, gamma, which we need to figure out what are alpha, beta, and gamma. What's V of 0? too hard, isn't it? 1. So now what's W of 1? Alpha plus beta plus gamma. And V of 1 is 2. Now what? Well, now we just put this into the inner product. We need V with W to equal 0, to be orthogonal, which means we simply multiply the W minus 1, V minus 1, W0, V0, and add those up. Or we now need 0 for V times alpha minus beta plus gamma plus the second coordinates, 1 times gamma, plus 2 times alpha plus beta plus gamma, and we need that to be 0. Is that okay? Or the first three terms are gone because they got scaled by V of minus 1, and we end up with 2 alpha plus 2 beta plus 3 gamma needs to be equal to 0. And can we find any values for alpha, 
beta and gamma to make this true. Yeah, we have a ton of them, don't we? We can make this vector w orthogonal many different ways. Let's just show a couple. If we now said what if we let the leading coefficient be zero? That now says that we need 2 beta plus 3 gamma to equal 0. And if I let gamma be equal to 2, then beta equal to minus 3 will work. And now I have, let's say, a w1, because I'm going to do this a couple of different times. I now have minus... 3 or beta times t plus gamma, which is 2. And that vector, w1, is orthogonal with the inner product that we used, is orthogonal to v of t equaling t plus 1. Or we could have said, you know what, I wasn't happy with that choice of alpha, beta, and gamma. What if I let my constant be zero, my gamma be zero? Then I have two alpha plus two beta plus, whoops, three. It's not going to matter, is it? Three times zero equaling zero. Or I now need alpha to be equal to minus beta. And if I let alpha be 1, or now I have a monic polynomial for my w vector, beta is now minus 1. And now I have another vector, w sub 2, that's now alpha t squared plus beta, which is minus 1 t or that's now t times t minus 1, and that's also orthogonal. To v of t. And if you wanted to, you could check that, right? Knowing what we now know, we have v of minus 1, that was 0, v of 0 was 1, v of 1 was 2, w2 of minus 1, what's that end up being? w sub 2 of t is just t squared minus t, if I plug in minus 1, I have 1 minus a minus 1, so is that 2? W sub 2 of 0. That's 0. W sub 2 of 1. Those are actually roots of W sub 2, aren't they? And now if I add all of those up, in my inner product, I now have 0 times 2 plus 1 times 0 plus 2 times 0. Every term has a 0 in it, and so it is orthogonal with that inner product. Questions on that? So now we have seen orthogonality in some abstract vector space that's maybe a little different than what we've been thinking about with vectors in the standard, in the conventional sense, in our Euclidean mind. But you can now play with that inner product on abstract vector spaces. Let's now return to the development, and in particular, let's use this orthogonality. If we are walking on a walk, I can now go west for a while, and then I can go north. 
And if I take those two distances and square it, it'll be the same as the hypotenuse connecting those beginning and ending points. Or that's my Pythagorean theorem, right? I didn't get very far, did I? PY, but maybe you knew what where I was going. Not the Python programming language, but now Pythagorean theorem. which in the textbook is numbered 6.3. So we're not very far into chapter 3, but we've now reached the Pythagorean theorem. For this, if we have two vectors, u and v, now what we need those vectors to be, though, is orthogonal in order to apply the Pythagorean theorem. If u and v are orthogonal, in our vector space V, then the length of U plus V squared, or the norm of U plus V squared, is equal to the norm of U plus the norm of U squared plus the norm of V squared. And now, instead of reading that book chapter, we can prove this pretty quickly using orthogonality and inner products. If we start with the right term in our inner product expression. Suppose now that we have u plus v quantity squared. Well, by definition, that's just the inner product of u plus v with itself. And we can split this up. Why don't we first do the additivity in the first slot? We can now say, well, that's u inner product with u plus v plus v inner product with u plus v. But now we know something about the second slot. It's additive too, isn't it? So now we can break out that first inner product into two, and we now have u with u plus u with v plus v with u plus v with v. And we can rewrite this. U with U, we can write as the norm of U squared. We can also write the norm of V squared. And then we have the inner product with U and V and V and U. But we assumed in our hypothesis that those were orthogonal. And what do we know is true when we have orthogonal vectors? We know their inner product is zero. So we know that's zero and that's zero, and now we end up with the left-hand side that we started with giving us the sum of the norms of those two. Now, in this proof, we did not depend on our definition of the inner product. We just assumed we had an inner product. We didn't have to be specific in how we defined it. We just needed to use the fact that the inner product gives us zero when we have orthogonality of two vectors. So we did not depend on our inner product. Our norm, so that's one, our norm definition changes along with the inner product definition, 
and we didn't specify that we were in a two-dimensional geometry, did we? We didn't say that our vector space V was R2. So now we have the Pythagorean theorem in a very generic setting. As long as we know the vectors are orthogonal, we can apply the Pythagorean theorem. The norm of u plus v squared, or a squared plus b squared equals c squared, is what you're used to seeing or hearing when you hear the Pythagorean theorem. But now we can say that u, the norm of u squared plus the norm of v e squared is the norm of u plus v squared. Now that we have orthogonality, we can actually start breaking up vectors into orthogonal components when we have two vectors. So let's now talk about this orthogonal decomposition. And now we're starting to build up some pretty powerful tools. Suppose we are given two vectors that are both in this vector space V and we ask the following question. How can we write the vector u in terms of v and a vector that's perpendicular to v? And now you might just sort of draw a picture. We now have two vectors, u and v, and now we want to rewrite u in terms of v and something perpendicular to v. Break it up into two pieces, the vector u. That's what we're wanting to do. Suppose that we now have some scalar a that belongs to our field of numbers, f. What we're wanting to do is we want to build up u as some scalar multiple of v, and let's just let the scalar be a, plus some piece that's orthogonal to v. Well, if u is equal to the right-hand side, the right-hand side has to be u, so we could define that to be u minus av, right? Haven't done anything really except we've split u into two pieces. One piece is some scalar multiple of v, and the other piece, this piece, needs to be orthogonal to v, is what we're saying. So now can we create or find the scalar a to make that happen? Bless you. So now if we want u minus av to be orthogonal to av, you now know how to create that relationship because we know that now we can use the inner product to make that happen. So to meet our goal, We need to choose this scalar, A. We need to choose A so that the vector V is actually perpendicular to this second vector in parentheses U minus AV. And it's easier if we sort of put that maybe in the first slot since it's easier to sort of see this additivity in the first slot maybe. Let's put the vector u minus av in the first slot of our inner product. We now want this u minus av to be orthogonal to v, so we now need the inner product to be zero. But now we can 
use additivity in the first slot to say that we now need uv minus, and let's now pull out this homogeneity relationship, minus A times the inner product of V with itself. So I've incorporated a couple of steps there in the last piece. But now we have the inner product of U and V minus A, but what's another way of writing V with itself inner product? That's the norm of that vector squared, isn't it? And we need that to be zero. And now we simply have A one place in this equation. We can solve for that scalar A. If we push things on one side and solve for A, we now want A to actually equal the inner product of U and V divided by the norm of V squared. And that's now the A that we need. That's the scalar amount that we need to move along V and then use that same A in our orthogonal component of that other vector. And now we can write U in terms of that parameterized A. Now we have this U is going to be A times V, but A is just U V inner product over V squared. That's our A times V plus U minus A. A again was U V over V squared times V. And this is now going to be an important result, but this is now an orthogonal decomposition of one vector into another vector and a vector orthogonal to that vector V. So now we've expressed V, or I'm sorry, U, so you could sort of think of this if you drew a picture. If this is now U, and now you might have V. You now want to sort of think of this, if I could draw an orthogonal line to that, that's what this is. Now this distance is A times V, and this additional orthogonal piece is the U minus AV. That's orthogonal to U. That's really all we're saying with this orthogonal decomposition in two dimensions. But it's now generalized to more dimensions than that. We just need the inner product, and that then allows us to compute the norm of our vector V and the inner product of U with V. And once we have that, we can build up this orthogonal decomposition of an, any vector u. And that's, we're going to be using this this result a fair amount this concept. Maybe we'll sort of add on to that. But let's write down one more result. Maybe we won't have time, but we need to do some CSI. So we need to do some cauchy schwarz inequality. If we're given a couple of vectors, u and v, in a vector space v, then the cauchy swarge actually says that the inner product of u and v, and take its absolute value, that's going to be less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v.
And the only time that's going to be an equality is if u and or v are multiples of one another. Or they're related, they're linearly related to each other. And we'll pick up at that point, but you might look at what this means and think about what happens when you have the absolute value relative to an inequality. This is another way of sort of writing this is you could say, oh, we now have minus u v less than or equal to the inner product of u and v less than or equal to u v. Remembering our results about the absolute value of a quantity being less than some number. Now we have these bounds and if we divided by u and v you'll see that now this inner product of u with v divided by the norm of u and the norm of v puts us between minus 1 and 1 and the cosine of theta is between minus 1 and 1 and now we can create this angle. We'll pick up at that point on Wednesday. Thank you for allowing me to